with Mike's co-host, George Rapp. George Jessel. Actress Molly Kakai. Rudy Valley. And now, here's the star of our show, Murray Douglas. Thank you very much. We're calling this show The Super Seniors. And there's one of them in the back right now. And Super describes my guests today from A to Z. And not just Super for what they are, but for what they have done. You take a look at my co host, George Raft, as a scrappy teenager. Look here. Huh? And here's Molly Peacock just a few years ago. And look at Rudy Valley when he still lived in Maine. And how about this shot of George Jessel? <laughs> These four people are special for another reason. They haven't grown old. And this song explains it all. Fairy tales can come true, as it can happen to you if you're young at heart. For it's hard you will find to be narrow vined if you're young at heart. Now you can go to extremes with impossible schemes. You can laugh when your dreams fall apart at the seams. And life gets more exciting with each passing day. And love is either in your heart or on its way. Don't you know? That it's worth every treasure on earth to be young at heart. For as rich as you are, it's much better by far to be young at heart. And if you should survive to a hundred and five, think of all you derive. Out of being alive And here is the best part You had a head start If you are among the very young at heart And if you should survive To a hundred and five Now think of all you derive Out of being alive And here is the best part you had a head start if you are among the very young at heart. Thank you. Talk about young at heart. Take a look at my co-host, the legendary George Rapp. Being a newsbreaker means breaking news fast. Jim, just seconds ago the meeting broke up, it appears. So you're always on top of things. John Law has ordered his men back to work. It began with a phone call once. It means breaking news no one else can break. I'm here to surrender myself. This is the test. It detects. And it means breaking news that has an effect on your life. The bow. You guys saved my wife's life. Believe me, this is something important. At Channel 2, they don't call them newsbreakers for nothing. I used to love toasted cheese. But now I love a hot Italian. Introducing Stouffer's three new hot Italian sandwiches. When I was a kid, I was really into hamburgers. Now I've got a hot Italian. Hearty sandwiches to have at home anytime. Simply heat and eat. I wanted something easy. 
It was peanut butter and jelly. Now, I've got the hot Italians. Stouffer's new hot Italian sandwiches in mild sausage, meatball, or hot sausage. Scientists estimate millions of germ-carrying roaches in our city, in outlying areas. They kill these roaches where they hide and breed. Black Flag's special city formula for tough city roach problems. Regular sprays scatter their power. Black Flag concentrates its killing power, penetrates cracks between cabinets and walls, between baseboards, and it's concentrated for long-lasting killing action up to four weeks. Kills roaches where they hide and breed. Black Flag's special city formula for tough city roach problems. Tony Randall for mm. Tetley Tea. I like those tiny little tea leaves in Tetley Tea. Know why Tetley Tea tastes so good? Because tiny is tastier. As a gourmet, I know that tiny peas and tiny baby lamb chops are the tastiest. The same with tea leaves. The most flavorful are the tiny young leaves packed into Tetley Tea bags. So for rich, refreshing tea, hot or iced, I drink Tetley because tiny is tastier. Well, George, you just told me your age. You want to tell this group? i very happy to. I was born 1895. Whoa! You are. When is your birthday? September the 26th. So you'll be 85 this That's year. That's right. Holy Toledo. <laughs> you Toledo look, you was look, right. You look wonderful. Thank you. What are you doing? What are you doing these days, George? <laughs> I don't do anything. I'm an ambassador of goodwill to the Riviera Hotel in Las Vegas. But you do go to an office every day and function yes. in, in an office here. Yeah, I sit there and people walk by and they say, is that you? And I say, yes. <laughs> Everyone loves commercials. And you, you've done a couple of commercials that a lot of... There's a line from a deodorant commercial. Lay that line on us in the deodorant commercial. You know the one oh, I'm talking the, about? Oh, the one about in the prison? Yeah. Where I say this place could use a, a stick-up. <laughs> <laughs> one line. One line. Then I do... I got one on that's on now. You're in the back of a limo, I think. Yeah, and I don't even know the girl that's sitting alongside me. I... You just got in there and delivered another line. That's all, and I said, uh, tune it up. <laughs> <laughs> that's a big hit. <laughs> that's wonderful. Did you ever think 20 or 30 years ago that you'd be doing commercials and doing just one line? No, Did that I, ever occur to you? No, it never occurred. I thought, I think they're great, the one-liners, oh, because wow. you're in and out. Yeah. I don't know what the commercial is about. I've never seen it. <laughs> <laughs> or care. Were you a quick study when yes. you were doing pictures? Yes. Uh, some people are blessed yes. with being able to look at a script and just, boom. Yeah, I was a pretty quick study, but I didn't have too many lines. Yeah. Because you... I always played the guy that, you know, w with a gun or something like that. After all, I, I was in 105 pictures, and I was killed 85 times. <laughs> I'm lucky you go, eh? <laughs> you were the original rat fake. <laughs> but you, you, did you get the girl in many pictures? I know away from the pictures, you got a lot of girls, George. Well, I yeah, that. I did pretty well that way, but uh, no, not in the pictures. I never, I always got killed. I heard, I heard through the grapevine that everything Errol Flynn claimed you were really doing. <laughs> is, is that true, George? I wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> Too much of a gentleman to yeah, talk about. Yeah, well, I, uh, I never would discuss women. You know, that was the thing that was out of well, my that's ballpark. That's wonderful. I always put all the women on a pedestal. But you went with some very beautiful women. Yes. Big, big stars. Yes. Can we name just a few of the ladies you dated? You name them. <laughs> <laughs> Carol Lombard? Yes. Betty Grable? Yes. Look at this. I, I'm yeah. batting a thousand. I only met you two people. Uh, Marlene Dietrich? Marlene Dietrich? Yeah. Didn't you have to do something to her in a movie one time? George, you've always been a perfect gentleman, and he meant what he said about ladies. He respects them. Uh, but they wanted you to clout her in a picture, didn't they? Yeah, they wanted me to hit her, and I said, well, I don't like to hit women. I never would do it in reality or real life. And, of course, they says, well, you must and must. And she came to me and says, George, you've got to hit me. I says, no. I, so finally went on for a couple of days, and I finally did hit her. And in the, she had a line where she was said with the, she was hit harder. But it, it, she twisted the line. She says, I've never been hit harder than that in my life. 
Didn't you knock her down and she yes, broke up? She broke, broke, her her broke her ankle. That one of those famous legs. Yeah. Holy Toledo. <laughs> Well, what the, uh, you know, I was a phony price fighter for a while. No, you, I, uh, now listen, yeah. Jimmy Cagney, when I interviewed Jimmy Cagney, I said something to the effect that you were a very tough kid. And he said, listen, let me tell you who is really tough. And he didn't say was, he said is. Uh, he said, one time I was fooling around with George Raft, and, and he said, I took my hand back, and George and said, Jim, you'd be sitting on the floor by the time you got that thing caught. That's right. <laughs> because spiders hit you right, boom, straight on. They don't draw them back, you know. Well, I, what could, what could a guy do when, who had no education? So I tried to be a price fighter, I tried to be a ball player, I was a dancer, and how I got in pictures, I don't know. How did you get in pictures? They picked me up. Who, who picked you up? <laughs> a fellow named Roland Brown. Where were you, in Roseland Ballroom or one of those no, places? No, no, I was, uh, I had just came back from England, and I came to California because I had played here in Vaudeville. I see. So I come out here, and I was sitting in the Brown Derby, which is right here on Vine Street. Sure. Famous and place. And a fellow came over to me and said, well, I'd like you to go into a motion picture for me. Just like that, not knowing what you and, could do? And I says, uh, well, I've never been a motion picture actor. I said, as a dancer. He says, yes, I know. He says, will you come down to the studio tomorrow? I said, I'd be very happy to. So I went what down. What studio was that, George? The William Fox Studio on Western Avenue. Uh-huh. And there was a man by the name of God, who was the casting director. And this fellow, Roland Brown, was the, the director and the writer of the, the picture. Spencer Tracy was the star oh, of the picture. So, Your first uh, picture, Spencer. So the wind-up piece is, well, I know George Raft. He was a dancer. He was famous in New York, working in all the places that he worked in. Who said that, Tracy? No, Gardner. Oh, Gardner. So, uh, but we got people on the lot that we have on the contract that we much rather put in the picture. So they kept arguing back and forth, and I says, look, wait a minute, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll go in, I'll do what you want me to do, and if my work is satisfactory, you make some arrangements to pay me. If it isn't satisfactory, you don't owe me anything. And I was the first one on the screen to say, I had touched my handkerchief and my hat, and said, this town isn't big enough for both of us, and one of us has to leave. You winged that line? You yeah. had lived that line? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, they called Who me. Who were you saying it to at the time? Uh, uh, Tracy, was it? No. Uh, Leon Ames, who later did the... Uh, did the drunk act. He was the perennial drunk, wasn't yeah, he? No, he was the guy that did uh, some television... Oh, Leon Ames yeah. was a Ford dealer here for a while, That's wasn't right. he? That's right, and uh, Bazooka Bob Burns. Oh, for God. And they play, all played gangsters. See, and I played Tracy's bodyguard. The you know who I was thinking of who played the perennial drunk? Leon Errol. Leon Errol. Remember how yeah. wonderful he was yeah. with those rubbery legs? But you actually said this town is... Uh, isn't big enough isn't, for both of us. And what did you do with your handkerchief? I and, touched my handkerchief and touched my hat and left. And that did it, a whole yeah. career from there. <laughs> and from when, there do you I, remember what they paid you, George, for that first stint? $150 a week. That was a <laughs> ton of money in those days, wasn't it? No, I no? don't know. You had made more in vaudeville? Oh, yeah. I made more as a dancer. I worked in four different places in a day. Were you ever? Were you a self-taught dancer, or yes, did people? Yes, I watched. I watched them up in Holland. I was. Oh, I was never a good dancer. Oh no! Wait a minute. No, I was a stylist. Well, that's better. Yeah, of course. I mean, I and I first introduced the French tango in America. Where did Where did you learn it? Just uh, I was in France when I was there, and I watched people dance, and I sort of introduced it, and I introduced a dance in a picture called Bolero. Is that the picture where they wanted to, sh you were with Carol Lombard, and they wanted to kill you while you were dancing with her? And no, that was the other one, Rumba. Oh, I did the Rumba before it was popular. <laughs> Ten years before, I didn't know I, what I was doing. How did, how did that happen? I don't know. I, I just thought of the different things, that was all. A rumba's just a takeoff on the two-step anyway, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it? well, it's... Uh, what they know, call a lindy today. We used to call it a lindy. Three, four, you yeah, know. Yeah, sure. And, of course, I was in Cuba, and watching the Cubans do, you know, rumba dancing, it's just sensational. You know, they don't move here, don't move there. Just it's the, just their backside. The hips, just the hips, they the hips go, yeah, dig it. Oh, it's they, nice. Yeah. And I learned how to dance up in Harlem, watch them dance. You, you got you got one of those rumbas left in you like the Cubans? No. No, no, no. no, no, no. I got Tell, an emphysema. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Tell the story about the little chorus girl who came to you and was out of money. And you were known for a guy who helped struggling actors. You had a lot of compassion. And oh, still yeah. Have. Well, I, I don't know. If somebody comes to you and needs help, you give it to him. 
And she came to you and had no money, no little money. chorus girl? Yeah, and I helped her what they were so what, sorry. What'd you give her, George? 300. You remember who she was? No. We know who it was. George. Yeah? You don't want to tell it. You're too, got too no. much class, huh? No. Would it bother you if I told? You don't want me yeah, to tell her. Don't okay, tell. I won't tell. Very important lady he helped. Yeah. Did you date her too, George? No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you... She became very famous, didn't oh, she? Oh, and how? <laughs> and how? The biggest yeah. name I know on television. <laughs> <laughs> You're quite a guy. Yeah. You really are. Who's your favorite... Uh, guy that you work with in pictures of all the people you've you worked with so many oh, super jobs i think cagney muni tracy oh. i work with so many academy award winners they all won the award but me did you ever were you ever nominated george yeah i was nominated i ran fourth <laughs> <laughs> can you find out in the top five where you were you placed? well i was i know i was fourth out of the money out of the out money, of the money. Yeah. Well, how my... was your son-in-law i mean he bets on all the winners <laughs> Was with a, you oh yes my yes. son-in-law came out i got i go to the track about once a year i saw george out yeah. there my son-in-law is uh, in the computers and everything and he's he's a very deep very bright kid and he's on the dean's list at, at wharton and he took a racing form i know from nothing in a race oh. i just look at the horses and if the horse looks like it's got a few breaths left i say well i like the way he looks and i like those colors and the name I'll, if it's a name I called one of my kids or something, I'll bet on that horse. My son-in-law said, Dad, that's not the way it works. He said, he picked four straight that's winners right. the day I was with yours, and I didn't catch on until about the third one. Oh, I, I bet on the third one. Did you I bet? You, the, yeah. Did you really? <laughs> well, certainly. Am I in on somebody action, Joe? No, yeah, any time. <laughs> George, in my book, as a movie star, you're a 10. A 10? A 10, yeah. <laughs> More with the Super Seniors right after this. All right, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Through the courtesy and confirmation of the Dime Savings Bank and the off, I'm going to offer the most sensational giveaway. All you got to do is introduce a friend to the Dime who will buy a 26-week certificate for ten to $35,000 or more, and you pick up one of these wonderful gifts. You say you're not satisfied? You say you want more? Okay, we're going to give your friend a gift, too, plus the highest interest rates. So, friends, rush right down to the Dime, and the next time you see me, you're going to thank me. Starting this week, Casey Kasem comes to television. Join him on America's Top Ten for a review of The Record Charts with special performances of key hits among this week's Top Ten. Catch Casey's exclusive interview with Blondie's Deborah Harry. And where are the monkeys now? What are they doing these days? This week with Casey Kasem on America's Top Ten. America's Top Ten premiere Wednesday at 7.30. Presenting Witchcraft, the tantalizing way to make a hot sandwich with the Sandwich Crafter by Equity. Make a Reuben Witch, a Pizza Witch, a Tomato Cheese and Ham Witch, and any which way sandwich. In just two minutes, the Sandwich Crafter crimps, seals, and toasts your sandwich to a golden brown. The Sandwich Crafter by Equity, where the ordinary sandwich becomes Witchcraft. Listen to why travelers in the Northeast are going Greyhound. With the price of gas and everything else, uh, Greyhound is, is the best way to go. As far as the schedules, um, I think you can go pretty much anywhere that you want to with Greyhound. Greyhound drivers do the driving for you. They do it well. And I'm free to sit back and relax and sleep or read or whatever I care to do. It's a lot cheaper to go Greyhound. Go Greyhound from any of the 23 suburban stations in the metro area, including seven on Long Island. Here's something that's always, I wanted to ask George about, and this, I thought that the first time I asked you that you were kidding me about it, of all the 105 movies this man has made, he has never seen himself on the screen. Is still, does that still go? Yes. What happens if you're passing a TV set and someone has one of your movies and you just turn your oh, back? Oh, I just keep going. <laughs> I want to tell you something, George, you're terrific in movies. No. You ought to look at them sometime. <laughs> From, from the first day, you've never seen any never brushes? Seen. Uh... No, I made a test many years ago when I was a dancer, and I 
guy rushed me up. At that time, they put bread in your eyes and made up your hands. And of course, Harry Richmond, God rest his soul in peace, made a test at the same time. And he looked like a black man on the screen. I said, oh my God, what am I gonna look like, you know? So I said, that's me, and they said, yes. And I, I would never look at myself after that. Oh, and when you became a big star, you still no, weren't even curious no, no. to look at? Because, as I said, everybody was better than me. So I just went along with him. <laughs> oh, you well, you got to see him. I want to tell you something. Yeah, Sometimes right. you got to check in because you were something else on that screen. I know they rerun one of them on Sunset Boulevard or something, Scarface. Yeah. And uh, people said, will you come down and see it? I said, no, I won't go, <laughs> won't go near the street. <laughs> I'd be too frightened. I mean, the way I look now, I was a young guy at that time. <laughs> It was 1928. I, I got news. You look, you look pretty darn uh, good right now, my friend. It's Doesn't he? Well, I know, I know what it's said about a lot of people, but my first guest is uh, truly a legend in his own time. Uh, just the mere mention of his name brings smiles to faces of millions of Americans. Here's the Toastmaster General himself. Here's George Jessel. Tell him about the you got knocked out twice in one night. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I've got to tell you a story that has to do with him. Having played these tough guys in ever so many movies, and uh, I have no reason to say this because we both haven't got much money, so I'm not going <laughs> to borrow any. You know, I don't have to incur his good favor any longer because I've had it for years. But here's a story about a gangster in Chicago, tough guy. Yet, on every Friday night, on the eve of the Shabbat, the Sabbath, he'd go out to Halsted Street and have this noodle soup and chicken with his mother. And this particular time, he came in an armored car, and as he got out in front of his mother's house, they shot at him real good. And he just had enough strength to climb up and knock on his mother's door and lay on the floor. He opened the door and said, hello, Mars. Mama. They got me. She's your lead later, then you'll tell me all about it. <laughs> That's right. George, I wanted to ask you, uh, the other evening I, I... You don't have to ask me. You tell me. I'm working for you. <laughs> but I, was, I, was in a, I was in a restaurant uh, down at the beach, and I ran into the famous Neil Diamond, who who was playing in a picture called The Jazz Singer. That's right. And you were the original jazz singer. Uh, well, I, I, I named the play and I wrote most of the dialogue. It's only 55 years ago. But I must say, uh, the Jolson version, all that has been discussed and repeated and badly, it's not as important as the Civil War. No, but weren't you before Jolson as the oh, jazz singer? Oh, well, of course. I was on the stage for three years. But the Warner Brothers at that time not only had no money to produce a movie, they had nothing to eat. And uh, they tried to dig up money from all over. They <laughs> finally got Jolson, and Al Jolson, you could make him believe anything you wanted. You could say, Al, uh, uh, have you played the cello lately? He said, no, not since last year. Never played the cello in his whole life. <laughs> so they told him it was the story of his life, <laughs> that the jazz singer was a boy who ran away and gave up a career uh, uh, as an artist and as an entertainer to take his father's place and sing to his god in the synagogue. And Joseph believed it didn't happen at all. <laughs> his father was a guy who made things kosher, killing chickens. And, um... <laughs> Are you serious? I'm very serious. They made that whole thing up? Yes, and, and, and he sent that big press story. This is the story of my life. But more important, <laughs> He put up the money to make the picture. <laughs> he had the money to, to sure. Warner Brothers. Sure. <laughs> Warner Brothers would have made it with Mickey Rooney. They didn't get. 
Oh, and, and, and rightly so. He's Mickey a great is guy. the toast of Broadway uh, and, and also up for an Oscar. Well, I'm and, glad. And, and, and he's a highly a talented fellow. Brilliantly and talented. And a very nice fellow, too, Mickey Rooney. I want to do something with right him. Right name is Rosenberg, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was Ewell. Ewell. <laughs> Joe Ewell. They fine. made that up. That was his father's name. <laughs> oh, this is wonderful. Any other stories oh, that are fallacies? Oh, yeah, I got all kinds of stories. Tell them about the time he got knocked out twice in one night. No, you like that because it had to do with knocking out. <laughs> when did you get knocked out twice in one night? I'll tell you when At we get through it. No. <laughs> I want to... No, wait, this I want to hear his story. No, this takes too long. <laughs> <laughs> This story is a true one. Two young cops are walking the beat, and they're anxious for promotion. And they get a meeting with the chief of police. One goes in, comes out a couple of slaves, and looks like I got a good chance to be promoted. The other guy goes in. She said to him, who killed Lincoln? And this young cop says, I don't know. He says, well, when you find out, come back. But the cop goes out, and the friend says, how did you do? Great, I just got a murder case. <laughs> Gag of the year, and uh, this year, uh, almost any year. It's your story <laughs> I've ever told. There's a guy with a, what do you call that with the heart? A Open pacemaker. Heart surgery. Pacemaker. pacemaker. And thank the Lord we don't. Uh, none of us need it until the show is over. Anyway. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> the guy I know, Stanley Cowan, he got a pacemaker. I says, how does it work? He says, fine. Every time I sneeze, my garage door opens. <laughs> Go ahead, yes, please. You're on a roll. Don't stop. And, uh, oh, I can do the whole two hours. You can go home with it. <laughs> I'll just sit yeah, here with your audience. I couldn't do it every day like you do. <laughs> anyway. There's a Brooklyn, an apartment house, you know, people live in the front, live in the back. Yeah. And these two women meet on the stairs. Woman says, Mrs. Cohen, did you see where they bombed our embassy in Pakistani? And the woman says, I live in the back, I never see anything. <laughs> Channel 2 News, News Watch with correspondent Roland Smith. Good afternoon. New York State's former controller for 24 years, Arthur Levitt, is dead at 79. Another black church set a fire in Far Rockaway, the fourth in two weeks. Police hunt the arsonist. President Carter declares parts of Florida a disaster area as the flood of Cuban refugees goes on, and the bodies of eight Americans killed in the Iranian rescue mission are coming home. Sure, Sir Isaac Newton unraveled the mysteries of gravity, but could he have unraveled the mysteries of Rubik's Cube? Three weeks ago, Judge Smith retired to her chambers with Exhibit A, Rubik's Cube. She hasn't been seen since. Warning, once you get your hands on Rubik's Cube, you may never be able to put it down. Rubik's Cube, over three billion combinations, but just one solution from Ideal. News Watch with Rowan Smith. All the news at 6. Mazola, for goodness. Our runners traveled over 100 miles and carried pouches filled with the goodness of maize, corn. Today, this goodness, corn oil goodness, is essential to Mazola margarine. So Mazola has no cholesterol, naturally. And a fresh, delicious flavor, naturally. Taste Mazzola margarine. It gets goodness from me. Mazzola, corn goodness. Announcing a price freeze at Genevieve's Drug Stores. Prices frozen on everything you buy in every Genevieve store. We're holding prices down by freezing regular prices on over 25,000 items. Prescriptions, cosmetics, health and beauty aids. Photo supplies, picnic items, auto supplies. Genovese is the first drug chain to freeze prices on everything. This is a price freeze, a real price freeze by Genovese, a real drugstore.
George, uh, since you know stories, and many, many of them, probably more than Milton Berle has stolen. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and I have some cards, and all I have, there's just one word on each of these cards, and I'll shuffle them up. And as I say the word, you tell a story about whatever the subject happens to be. You game? I'll, try, I'll take a chance, sure. Right. Wives. A lucky guess. Well, wives. There's all kinds of stories about wives. I know I waited many, many years for a wife of mine, and she always reminded me of the story about Will Rogers, you know? Where he said he never met a man he didn't like. I had a wife like that. She never met a man. <laughs> Mother-in-law. Uh, uh, <laughs> no, he can't help you. No. You gotta go on on your own. I never had any jokes about mother-in-law because. Oh, good. Let's go on to something else. Yes. All right. <laughs> Doctors. Oh, I know oh, we got a good subject. Okay. Go to the next <laughs> one. See if you can find it. Restaurants. Well, there's a lot of jokes about. <laughs> <laughs> Restaurants, I remember. <laughs> it's funny, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but this is uh, dirty. I wouldn't, wouldn't even tell this. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> Fox. Let's go on to another one. Money. Oh. Got to be something there. Money, I lost a great deal of money in the stock market. And the, my last trip was as a friend of mine, God love him, Chico Marx. You remember Chico? Yes, yes. And uh, he had no idea of the value of money. He'd give guys $50 to play against them in a card game. Just to have a game. To have some fun. And he borrowed some money from his brother Harper, who was an angel, and from me, to go to Canada to play an engagement in a nightclub. And he called me up and called all of his pals up and said, Look, I found a way that we can get rich. And to buy this stock, I'll guarantee you against loss. Now, he just borrowed the money to go to Toronto. <laughs> He's going to guarantee us for the loss. Anyhow, what they did with him, they showed him some pennies on a wall and said, this is a copper mine. Well, <laughs> and how this happened? Well, he says, I was in a pool room and uh, playing pool, and a ball jumped off the table, which happens every once in a while. And when the guy went to look for it, under the pool table, they found uranium. Now, how this grows under a pool table in t Toronto, I have no idea, but I'm not a geologist, is what happened. Well, he said the guy who racks up the balls, found it, he made him the president of the company. And uh, you can get in 10 cents a share. And I bought a few thousand shares at 10 cents. And a few days later, he said, it's 24 cents now. I said, sell it. He said, to who? <laughs> Uh, if you have any more, I'll wait till I go on the next show. We'll be going. <laughs> How about uh, doing your classic Hello Mother bit? No? Oh, if Remember it's all that? up to your audience, I'll be glad. <laughs> you know, I, I, like, I like the phone. Well, it's, it's the old <laughs> Super 70 it's the old show. fashioned phone. <laughs> and he'll bring me out with this in an age, uh, a permissive age. I saw one of those pawny movies the other night, and I was embarrassed. And the third time I saw it, I even more. <laughs> <laughs> it's a remarkable thing, though, that which has good humor and warm humor lives despite what they buy in Vegas or whatever joints are still open. And I introduced this years ago, where I came on the stage, picked up a phone like this, and supposedly talked to my mother. And since then, nearly everybody has copied it. Uh, what's his name? B Berman, the name Berman, everybody. But I have no enmity. I like to believe what Mrs. Eddy said, that no one's errors offend you but your own. So I'm not angry at these fellows who have stolen my stuff. They should just fall off the top of the Washington Monument. <laughs> <laughs> Operator, I like to get a long distance call, New York, Umglick, 8625. Fourth, yes. Thank you very much. Tina, da, 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 da. Tina, hello. How are Mr. Schwartz? How are you, Mr. Schwartz? Georgie Jessel. How are you? 
You just fell down the stairs and broke your ankle? Oh, for heaven's sake, a woman your age, break an ankle. Would you mind running up two flights and ask my mother? <laughs> oh, my mother is right there helping you. Well, I'm glad that she has that navelly spirit. Put her on the phone. Hello, Mama. Your son, Georgie. Your son from the money every week. <laughs> How are you? How are you? You see spots in front of your eyes? Or wear your glasses like Dr. Bloomberg told you? They're on your forehead. Well, how long will it take you to get it down? This is like the Brooklyn Bridge. You got the glasses on? How is it? You see the spots better with the glasses. <laughs> how did you like that bird I sent you home for the parlor for your birthday? You cooked it? <laughs> Mama, there's a South American parrot. He spoke five languages. He should have said something. <laughs> about my sister Anna. Uh, look, look, put her on the phone, will you? Look, Anna, I'm your oldest brother. And if I don't have your interest at heart, who's going to have it? Now, what's going to be with that fellow of yours, honey? You're engaged now over 32 years. <laughs> you think you'll be married next winter? Why? He said it'll be a cold day when... Hey, well, I'll tell you. <laughs> Why do you love him so much? He's kind-hearted, he's good to animals. Why? But when you go in the street, the dogs lick his hands. If he'd eat once with a knife and fork, they wouldn't do that. <laughs> but put your mother back on the phone. Mama, there's no need of talking to her. The girl's in love, and there you are. You know what Longfellow tells us? Tell me not in mournful numbers, life is but an empty dream. I say, Longfellow told us that. I shouldn't go around with him, he's drunk. <laughs> no, no, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, the poet. He didn't live next door to us at all. That was Lowenstein, a bookmaker who lived next door. <laughs> yeah, who's making all that noise? My little brother, Moe's friend, Sammy, what is he yelling about? He just swallowed a $5 gold piece that I gave my mother for Christmas? What are you going to do about it? Oh, Sammy's going to live with us for a while. <laughs> Raw T bones in a toaster, but you can in this GE toaster oven. You cannot bake a pizza in a toaster, but you can in this GE toaster oven. This GE toaster oven not only toasts, but it bakes and broils using less electricity than a big oven. You can't bake chicken in a toaster, but you can in this GE toaster oven. GE, we bring good things to life. Dad. Would you look outside? The sun is shining. There's a new Mr. Muscle. New improved formula. Works daytime or overnight, and it cleans tough baked on food spots. Just wipe. Just wipe. For quick daytime or easy overnight, you're the just wipe oven cleaner. That's new Mr. Muscle. Psst. Are you sure your clay litter controls odors? Uh, no. Be sure? <laughs> Hardly. You can't be sure with the leading clays. Their perfume and colored specks can't control odors as well as litter green. Litter green with chlorophyll is 100% natural deodorizers. Every pellet controls odors better. I'm sure of only two things, diamonds and litter green. Get litter green and be sure. You know, besides starring in, in hit Broadway musicals like Milk and Honey and movies like Fiddler on the Roof, 
My next guest also spent her early years on the vaudeville stage and, of course, is one of the biggest stars of the Yiddish theater. She fit a lot of living into one life, and she fit it all between the covers of this book. Here is super senior Molly Pecan. <laughs> your outfit. Yeah, Thank you. That nice. is nice. You're beautiful. Did you design that, Molly? No, Eduardo is my tailor, and he makes these things special for me, oh. so I can sit down in them comfortably. <laughs> you look wonderful. Well, here I am with the boys. The boy, yeah. <laughs> you, you've worked with Mr. I've Jessel? I've worked with Jessel. I've known Jessel all his life and all my life, but this is my first That's time right. of meeting with George Reft. My Glad pleasure. to know you, sir. Glad to know you. <laughs> okay, now I we didn't better get a be chance quick. to see you on Second Avenue because I was working all night. And, and you wouldn't have known the language either in no, those I days. No, I wouldn't. George, you did. Yeah. How long have you been in, this, in show business, Molly? Uh, here we go. <clears throat> 76 years. Wow. I've got underwear older than that. <laughs> how, long is, how long have you been in here? 72. 72. And you, George? You started when you were a kid? Yeah, I guess about 62. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, no. young people well, are young people. You know, it's the one thing we never forget in this business, it, no matter how successful we are, is when we bomb. Oh. Have you ever bombed? <laughs> oh, I bombed. The last show I did, we bombed. It was called Chuchem, and it was about a couple that came from um, America to China, and they were looking for Chinese Jews, and they couldn't find them. And Menasha Skolnick played it with me. And let me tell you, this was one of the worst experiences I ever had. What play was this, Molly? Chuchem. Chuchem. Which in Yiddish is chuchem. You know what chuchem is? Chuchem, I know. Do any of you know what chuchem is out there? Well, we oh, we know now. It means the... Who said Sunset Boulevard? <laughs> <laughs> Like hookers. <laughs> Unfortunately, it was a million dollar bomb. It was very sad. But we buried that one. Now I. Did you feel it, sense it during rehearsal? Oh, yes, rehearsal? I knew from the beginning. From the beginning? I knew of the from the beginning because it was being directed badly and it was being rehearsed badly. And it was just off on the wrong foot from the beginning. I tried to get out of it, but I couldn't. They were going to sue me if I left for a half a million dollars or something. And oh, yeah. so I had to go on with it. Was it played in English or in. In, in English, darling. In yes. English. Oh, yes. At least if what Menashe That's bad with most plays these days. Yeah. They're played in England. <laughs> Did you ever flop, George? Did I ever flop? Yeah. Sure. I'm doing it recently. <laughs> <laughs> One thing about movies, you know, television, occasionally the deep six a tape. Yeah. You know, but in movies, those things are around to haunt you forever, aren't they? Well, I flopped at the Chicago Theater with Ben Burney, God rest his soul. Oh. They didn't know when we were on the stage. <laughs> oh, my God. And, <laughs> and the next week, we went to Milwaukee, and we were a sensation. That's strange. The isn't same it? show. That's the same show. <laughs> Would you ever flop, George? Well, I had uh, one of the greatest successes that anybody ever had in the show business since the days of Joseph Jefferson and Rip Van Winkle. A play that I wrote a great deal of and appeared on the stage for three years called The Jazz Singer. Mm -hmm. And after The Jazz Singer, I had a wrote a play myself and played it called The War Song, Bust. And then I was in another play called From the Bible, Joseph and His Brethren. And this will be interesting to you, Molly, knowing the people of our religious background, mm -hmm. as you do. Uh, Joseph and His Brethren was written satirically from the biblical story of Joseph. And all the Jewish people that came to see me and other things said, Jessel is making fun of the Bible, and they walked out. Mm -hmm. So I had a failure after that. Then I wrote a, a musical play called The High Kickers, starring Sophie Tucker and myself. And that was a failure. Mm. And uh, I asked you for one flop, I got your whole career. Oh! <laughs> called Showtime, which was a big hit. Oh, it was still flopping. Yeah. And then, no, no. Oh, well, that's a big and hit. A big hit, but then I went into the movies, and I produced 23 movies for 20th Century Fox. You had some big hits Most there. of them successful. Yes, indeed. Now yeah. I'm here for about $8. <laughs> 
<laughs> but that's before the deductions. <laughs> You know, Georgie, I have a, a story about this, uh, the 12 brothers. Uh, one of our managers sent it on the road, a Jewish play, and they weren't doing business. So this manager called and he said, well, add a couple of more brothers, you know, you'll make a big production of it. He didn't know that there were only 12 brothers. So he, he said, that should save them. You know, you add 16 more brothers and let them dance a little bit <laughs> so they would improve the play. You and, you and your late husband, Yanko, went to Poland remember yes. and he introduced you to his mother mm -hmm. tell that story that's that's so wonderful it's well, in your book and... his mother was an orthodox jewess she had never been in this in a theater she'd never seen a theater and she didn't know what it was all about and so yanko tried to explain to her that um, our profession is just like the um, the people in religion they, they they preach to people but we sing to people and it's the same thing so she said sing for me so i sang uh, don't uh, write a letter to your mother you shouldn't be proud if you have mom, mom and, and you, you shouldn't be proud uh, uh, with money uh, <laughs> and, and all these beautiful songs and she cried and she laughed and and then she said my god she said that is beautiful she said but the, are the american jews so dumb that they pay money for that <laughs> Good afternoon. The State Department denies a congressman's report that the U.S. is planning a massive airlift on a, for a half million Cuban and Haitian refugees. Many of the Cubans are flooding New Jersey communities. Roseanne Coletti will report live from West New York. The bodies of the U.S. servicemen killed in the failed Iranian rescue attempt are on their way home. And in New Jersey, Arnold Diaz uncovers evidence of overcharging in the cleanup of that Elizabeth chemical dump. And the man who held New York's purse strings for a quarter of a century, Arthur Levitt, dies at 79 at 6. Come on, Alice! We're going! Go ahead. I just want to finish something. Some people have a funny reaction to FM 99. What a good song. Once they turn us on, they can't turn us off. Burning the midnight oil, eh, Miss Fletcher? I'm just cleaning up a few details. <laughs> oh, my favorite. We admit we don't make it easy, because at FM 99, we play one good song after another. Songs from now and then. I remember that one. Mm. Tom, this cider's terrific. It ought to be. It's 100% pure apple juice. Just like Mazzola's 100% pure corn oil. And you can't improve on the natural goodness of corn. And, of course, no leading oil tastes lighter than Mazzola. So the taste of fresh vegetables really comes through. And what about cholesterol? Mazzola doesn't have a drop. And it's low in saturated fat. Mazzola corn oil, 100% pure. Because you can't improve on the natural goodness of corn. We play in our pool while he works on his, because we use HTH while he adds chlorinators and algicides plus shark treatments. Save time and money with HTH. It's my primary chlorinator, algicide, and shock treatment all in one. HTH. Spend less on your pool. You'll get more out of it. Can opener! Buy HTH now and get up to $9 in value by mail. Details at participating dealers. Oh, that could be a hit. That was the, uh, the, the end of the write a letter to your mother. A people of the woman. Listen, what about that fight you had? Was it a fight? Knocked out twice in one yeah, night. Yeah, knockout fight. What was that? Oh, he likes that. <laughs> oh, this will take even next week's show over. <laughs> I'll save it for the next time. Remind me. Uh, you know, uh, I asked George, and he, he was gentleman enough that he didn't want to... Uh, tell us the lady's name, but he loaned uh, this little chorus girl $300 when she was destitute. She had no money. you have any stories like that? People that you helped who are now famous, Molly? No. No. <laughs> Unless it's Listen, myself. Listen, you were knocked out twice in one night. <laughs> well, I, helped, uh, I helped a lot of people. <laughs> when, uh, when Lincoln was going to college <laughs> in the middle of the you bought him the top hat? Yes. No, I bought him a yamel kit. <laughs> Tell about... him about the two Jews that got off the, you know. Huh? 
about the two Jews that got off in Arabian or something? Oh, no, no. no. <laughs> she told me this a little while ago. I was saving it for her, but you don't mind if I tell no, her. Go ahead. There's two guys in Israel on Deason Gulf Road, and they're waiting on the corner. Where were they? Deason, that's the name of the street, Deason Gulf Road. Oh. And uh, you can call it uh, Mulberry, what the hell do I care? Anyhow, <laughs> they're standing on the corner, one says to the other, uh, who are you waiting for? I says, I'm waiting for the plumber. I says, who are you waiting for? I'm waiting for the Messiah. It says, he'll get here before the plumber. <laughs> Didn't you once help Henry Fonda? Seriously. Oh, yes, Henry was in a play, my first English play, called Birdie, and he was an assistant's assistant, and he came to Yanko, my husband, and he said, you know, I don't want to be an assistant director, I want to act, and the Guild offered me a job and for a small part, so Yanko said, go ahead, Henry, and we can do without you, you know, we'll get somebody else. This was many years ago. Now, we went to see him last year. He's doing a play about the judges, the... Uh, I don't oh, the uh, Clarence Darrow. Yes. Yeah. And so I'm with friends, and I told them a story. They said, why don't you go back and see him? I said, oh, he will never remember me. You know, it's about 40 years. They said, well, go back and try. So I went back, knocked on the door. He opened the door. He said, Molly Pecan, do you remember Birdie? And he went through the whole story. <gasps> that's the Isn't kind of man. That's yeah, kind of man. He's a wonderful yes. man. Yes. He remembered We made a every picture line. together. Yes. Did you, any of you have stage mothers? Not you know, the, I did. No. You did, George? <laughs> Did not, she, did not she know the story about you being knocked out twice? In no, one no. <laughs> the only real stage mother, there were two that I knew. Burl's mother. Many right? Burl's mother. Yep. Who would sit in the audience. She was a professional lapper, wasn't not she? Not only that, she stood up, I remember one with a revolver, said, if you want to applaud my son, I'll kill everybody in the audience. <laughs> Close to that. Do you remember Elsie Janis? Do you? Yes, yes I, do. I do. She had a stage mother, and she wasn't terribly pretty. But her mother believed that she was a combination of every beauty that the world has ever known, and rightly so. What else is there for a mother to believe in, that her son or her daughter are the loveliest and most talented people in the world? This is the blessed thing of motherhood. And while I believe this most sincerely, and I have, I believe, something to tell every time I speak publicly, and that is this. I believe in women's rights. Anything that a woman is qualified to do, she should do. But you'll notice on a sinking ship, women don't want any lib. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been like it was women first in the lifeboats. <laughs> you did something on my show one time, and, and it's, you, you were lovely enough to relate it in the book and talk about it in the book, but you did a, a poem on my show, and we got such response yeah. They, they actually asked me upstairs, please, don't do any more of this. We can't handle the mail. Mm -hmm. It was an avalanche. In yep. Would you do it for us today, Molly? <laughs> I am a puzzled Dutchman, what's filled with grief and shame. I'll tell you what the trouble is. I doesn't know my name. You think that's very funny, but when you the story here, you will not wonder then so much it was so strange and queer. My mother had two little twins. They was me and my brother. We looked so very much alike, no one knew one from the other. One of the boys was Jacob, and Hans the other's name. But then it made no difference. We both got called the same. Well, one of us got dead. Yeah, mine hair, that is so. But whether Hans or Jacob, my mother, she don't know. So now I am in trouble. I can't get through mine head, whether I am Hans what's living or Jacob what is dead. <laughs> Of all times to get hemorrhoids. I got them when I was expecting, sis. What'd you do? Use Preparation H. Many find it gives temporary relief for hours from flare-ups. Combines active ingredients to relieve pain and itch. Sounds like real medicine. Even helps shrink swollen inflamed hemorrhoidal tissue. I'll try it. Well, since you're expecting, check with your doctor before using any medicine. Hi, sis. How goes it? Great, thanks to Preparation H. Oh. Preparation H relieves pain and itch, helps shrink swelling. Very. Like some coffee? Oh, Mr. White, coffee stains my dentures. Discover extra strength Efferdent. The most powerful Efferdent ever. Here's coffee stain on denture material. 
Everett, it looks powerful. It has five cleaning ingredients that remove stubborn stain. Even in between. Ah, how'd you like Everdent? How'd you like to give me some coffee? Black. Extra strength Everdent removes even stubborn stains between teeth. And if you brush, use Everdent Denture Cleanser Paste. Brushes off stain, brushes on mouthwash freshness. Mom's incredible. She has arthritis, but insists on making the family breakfast, even when her arthritis is acting up. Some mornings when she got up, she'd take aspirin. But she's more careful to use bufferin now. Aspirin sometimes upset her stomach, but bufferin adds protection ingredients. Bayer and Anison don't. Bufferin relieves her minor pain and its stiffness fast. Morning, Grandma. And it works for hours. Thank goodness Mom's more careful to use bufferin now. Come follow the band wherever it's at. Come follow the band. Come follow the raves. Barnum. Frank Rich, New York Times calls Barnum pure exhilarating fun. Clive Barnes, New York Post says Jim Dale is a one-man, three-ring, four-star circus. It works. My, how Barnum works. John Simon, New York Magazine. And Chauncey Howe says Jim Dale is a wonder and Barnum is an amazement. Barnum, the musical amazement, now at the St. James Theater. For tickets, call charge at 239-7177. Now, during the early days of radio, millions of people would tune in every week to hear my next guest sing his theme, My Time Is Your Time. With his megaphone and his raccoon coat, he was the crooner of his day. And we're delighted he's here with us today. Here is Rudy Valley. a million times if I have told you once before but words like these can bear repeating and so I tell you once more your eyes are twice as blue as all the blue skies your lips are twice as sweet as any kiss your voice is twice as sweet as any angels you're really twice as sweet as any miss your cheeks are twice as pink as all the sun sets. Your hair is twice as gold as golden threads. All these things are nice. Here's why they're nicer twice. For you're the only girl I know that has two heads. <laughs> Lord, uh, Lord, you fool, I love you. I'll never forget the first time I met you. Don't think I haven't tried. <laughs> there you were sitting, sitting on the Golden Gate Bridge with your feet dangling in the water. <laughs> you were dazed, you were trembling, honey, you were loaded. <laughs> there you were with the moonlight shining through your varicose veins. <laughs> your legs looked like a road map, nine miles of bad road. <laughs> and your teeth, your teeth are like sparkling water, one down and seven up. <laughs> I love you, you fool. I love every hair on your lip. <laughs> Those nights in the park, we sat on the bench and I'd cross my eyes and look straight into yours. <laughs> the faint smell of your perfume, Shanley's number five. And your dainty feet, paratrooper number 12. <laughs> I used to call you my melancholy baby. You had a head like a melon and a face like a collie. <laughs> I wanted to buy you a handkerchief for your birthday. But I didn't know the size of your nose. You prided yourself in being fastidious. Yes, indeed, your father was fast and your mother was hideous. I remember your lonely, tragic youth. You couldn't go walking. Your feet were too big. You couldn't go swimming. Your arms were too large. And you couldn't go horseback riding. Any questions? I love you, fool. I love the ground your father struck oil on. Our favorite restaurant, that Jewish-Chinese restaurant where we had gefilte foo young. <laughs> I remember the night I took you to your first dance. It was your first dance. And you wore that daring gown. The gown was daring because the hem was 29 inches from the floor. What made it even more daring was the fact that you were only 39 inches tall. <laughs> I tried to take the fur from your neck. It was growing there. <laughs> remember the time when I took you home from night court and all the guys in the corner whistled as we went by. What did they think I was out with a dog? <laughs> I often wondered if nature had gifted you bonderfully in the manner of Jane Russell, Marie Wilson, Denise, Denise Nassel, 
Lola Brigida, Sophia Lauren, Enid Eggberg, Jane Mansfield, Diana Dawes. That night we were driving along in my car, my right arm was around your waist. I thought I'd find out. I started to explore. You cried, here, here. I said, where, where? <laughs> you said, there, there. You forgot that I used to work in a garage and fix flats. But it was really, it was really your eyes that did it. Your right eye was so beautiful, your left eye kept staring at it. <laughs> and your skin, your skin was like a peach, fuzzy. <laughs> I remember when I took you to Canada. I took you to Canada and you look better there. It's moose country. <laughs> I even wondered those were your knees or were you smuggling walnuts? Or were you bow-legged? You were so bow-legged that when you sat around the house, you really sat around the house. <laughs> You could get out of a car on both sides at the same time. You could walk down a bowling alley while the game was going on. You were so bold like they hung you over the door for good luck. And your brother, your brother was knock kneed, knock kneed. When you stood up together, you spelled ox. But it was your beautiful tremulous lips, your lovely lips. What other girl could seal a letter after it was in the mailbox? <laughs> Now I knew why you used gunpowder on your face. Your face is all shot to hell. <laughs> Just one look, and then I knew that you're the only girl I know that has two heads. Your mother's humming tosh. The only girl I know that has two heads. <laughs> Rudy Valley. We're coming right back. I just walked from New York to Los Angeles, and I have to do it again tomorrow. Without Dr. Scholl's air pillow insoles, <laughs> I wouldn't make it to Pittsburgh. I'm on my feet eight hours a day. Hey, I'd be out of business without air pillow insoles. Put a pair of Dr. Scholl's air pillow insoles in your shoes and experience the difference they make. The soft layer of comfort between you and the hard ground can make your feet hold up longer. And when your feet feel good, you feel good. Take three. Three tablets? No, Anison 3. Its pain reliever gives the most effective headache relief you can buy without aspirin. Right. Two regular headache tablets have 650 milligrams of pain reliever. But Anison 3 has much more. 1,000 milligrams per dose. Yet it's 100% aspirin free. So when you've got a headache... Take three. Anison 3. The most effective headache relief you can buy without aspirin. Hi. I'm Joel Lombardi, the inflation fighter. Let me give you three reasons why you should buy your General Electric TV and major appliances at LD. Number one, LD is one of the largest General Electric dealers in New York. Number two, LD is one of the largest General Electric dealers in New York. And most important, LD's new one low price for cash policy saves you money. Watch closely. What's made with real natural fruit, like grapes, apricots, apples, and rolled up into one delicious, wholesome, fun snack? Grocer's Choice Fruit Snacks. Just unroll, tear off, and chew, chew, chew. Mmm, mmm, that's good fun. There are raspberry, apricot, strawberry, apple, cherry, grape, and plum. Grocer's Choice Fruit Snacks. So pick your favorite from the fruit snack basket. Next best thing to fresh fruit. Mike Douglas continues after these messages and station identification. Good afternoon. The U.S. denies it's about to airlift a half million refugees out of Cuba and Haiti. An Air Force jet carrying the bodies of American servicemen home. The eight died in the failed rescue attempt in Iran. A fourth terrorist shot in the raid in the Iranian embassy in London dies today. And former New York controller Arthur Levitt is dead at 79. The election that New York held, and very few came, we'll tell you about that. A call to keep subways from falling apart, Chris Borgen will report. And the end of the line for the suburbs, a special report from Meredith Vieira called Mortgage Nightmare. And the great egg cream cart caper, Randall Pinkston reports tonight at 6.
TSA celebrates Mother's Day with 60% off all 14 karat gold chains and bracelets, 40% off diamonds. Save now at all TSS department stores. There's a lot of great reading in the new issue of TV Guide. Look for the cast of One Day at a Time on the cover. Linda Lavin in Like Mom, Like Me, tonight at 9. Uh, if you met George Raft early in your career, didn't you? I didn't meet him. It was in 1924, which would be 56 years ago. I was a student at Yale, and I came up in the spring of 1927 to one night in New York City to go to some of the nightclubs, all alone by myself, just to find the scenes from nightclubs. In those days, nightclubs were the big thing in New York, about 150 of them. And I went into a little spot called Tommy Guinan's Playground. He was the brother of Texas Guinan, who later became a very big star. On, on 52nd Street, just off 7th Avenue, and there was a very small room. It must have been the opening night. And I saw this woman sit, seat herself on a piano and sing. It was Helen Morgan. Good. The first established nice. had to sing, sit on the piano and sing. Sitting on and top And this man of the who came out looking exactly like Valentino. I had played for several appearances of Valentino in Connecticut, and I admired his good looks, and I saw his hypnotic effect on these 5,000 women that crowded all these big armories where he made his appearances. And here was this man who looked exactly like Valentino, who did this sort of shuffling dance. Nothing sounded very exciting. But I said to myself, he looks exactly like Valentino. Then, as the years passed, he used to stand in front of a store called Ben Rock's ha Haberdashery store, very fine clothing, with his top coat on, his hat on his head, and he'd stand there in front of the store for about an hour. I don't know what he was waiting for, but he used to stand there. I'd see him outside driving. There was George Rock standing in front of Ben Rock's store. Then in 1929, I'm now a star, and I came out to make a picture, a little faded picture called The Vagabond Lover, and Sunday, Saturday afternoon brunch at the Brown Derby in Vine Street. There he was in the booth. I went over and I said, they finally recognize the fact that you look like Valentino. He said, well, I'm in a picture called Scarface. He didn't tell me how he tossed the court. Oh, oh yeah, that's right. You know, what that means? you know, Mike, a lot of people may not know, but Rudy was the first one that had pink, pink champagne. He was one of the owners. <laughs> no, no, no. Yes. I, I was never an owner. Oh, you and Johnny D'Augustine. Yeah, the, uh, isn't that right? Egg Harbor, the uh, French name of the, uh, the winery. In the... Renault. Renault. Renault oh. winery, yes. Johnny D'Agostino, who was finally killed in an automobile accident, was a fantastic guy, fantastic. Had this little winery, he had a wonderful pink champagne. I looked at sparkling burgundy better. Oh, you did? Sparkling burgundy. Well, I don't drink, champagne. so I wouldn't know about yeah, that. <laughs> you know something? I haven't been so quiet in over 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> Were all of you around in the days of the speakeasies? Yes. Oh, very much oh. so. Some of the best stories in, in life have come out of speakeasy stories. Do you have any, Rudy? Well, the only one I can really remember that I feel was a speakeasy, but it really wasn't, was Leone's Restaurant. It was, in the essence, a speakeasy restaurant. And Jack Osterman took me there between shows at the New York Paramount Theater. Who was he, really? And introduced me to one of the finest oh, Italian restaurants great. in the world. But Joe would greet you there with a couple of teeth punching. He glares at you, maybe he'd let you in. And there you'd find William S. Hart, the governor of New York. You'd find all the big stars of the world eating this tiny little building. Never was raided, served booze. Manny Wolf's also had a big, long bar. Never was raided. You'd walk, walk into Manny Wolf's a big, long bar. You'd find all the stars, the governor. This is during Prohibition, too. Yes. It's right down in the bar. <laughs> Wide open bars, huh? Mm -hmm. Well, all when I worked for Texas Guinan, you couldn't get in unless you give the doorman $50. And what was a bottle of scotch in those days? Well, I, not being a drinker, I didn't know. How much but I'd say about twenty dollars, twenty, thirty dollars. I used to give waiters jobs, and they used to give me fifty dollars to get the job in the Texas Diner Club. Because you look like Valentino. <laughs> <laughs> what do you remember about speakeasies? You were knocked out twice in one night. In well, there. <laughs> I remember a great deal about them, and uh, of course, prohibition was a horrible, bad law, like some of the most hypocritical laws we have in our blessed country. Just think, Nevada, California, this close together, an inch apart. Now, you bet $100,000 here, your foot slips, you bet a buck in California, and you go to jail. <laughs> and in Delaware, if a guy sees you kissing a girl on Sunday, you go to jail. And in the state of Washington, if you're at a bar and I come in and you get up with a drink, hi, Georgie, you go to jail. Hypocrisy. 
And in I remember... Delaware, you can get put in jail for kissing a girl on Sunday? If oh, somebody you sees you. You could be oh, locked up a lot. Not only that, you could be... <laughs> and you put in stocks, you know, too, not only in jail. Oh. And that's not a stock company. That's it. <laughs> Anyhow, I'll tell you speakeasy what I know about story. speakeasy. The biggest one is now one of the few restaurants famous in America and in New York. One of the few left in the called Manhattan. And it's the 21 Club. And it was a speakeasy. And then finally the prohibition was beaten. They became a regular restaurant. And the mayor, I think it was Fiona LaGuardia, asked me to open it and give it a note of dignity as a restaurant. And I did. And I said, this is hallowed ground, because here, in this 21 Club, is an American restaurant where the average American and his family can come and have a wonderful dinner for $3,500. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been there since. <laughs> I still wish oh, he'd tell me. that story. About being knocked, knocked out, out twice? twice. Oh, <laughs> it'll run a whole program, George. Molly, speak Well, easy. the only place I met that kind of um, government was in Russia, and uh, a man knocked at the door of a Russian, and the, the man answered, it was 3 o'clock in the morning, he said, who is it? He said, it's the mailman. He opened the door, and it was the KGB. So, and he walked in. He said, "Your name is Mr. Levine." He said, "Yes." You made it. Uh, uh, you want to go out of Israel? He said, "Yes." He said, "Why don't you have enough to eat?" He said, "Yes." He said, "Do your children go to school?" He said, "Yes." He said, "Then well, why do you want to leave Russia?" He said, "Because I don't want to live in a country where they deliver mail at three o'clock in the morning." <laughs> You were dubbed for years the Vagabond Lover, and yet you said moments ago, and I never knew this, that was ill-fated movie, the Vagabond Lover. They're still fumigating the theaters where it's shown. <laughs> it almost ruined me. In fact, I think it's only shown in penitentiary and comfort stations. <laughs> you know, when you did your radio show, now I remember that, you started a lot of people, you gave a lot of people Opportunities. We were the Palace Theatre of the Air. The J. Walter Thompson Agency deserves a lot of credit for many of the personalities they put on. But I had, see, I had the approval. They disapproved, I could disapprove. And when somebody said Bergen, a ventriloquist, I thought for a moment, and I listened to him doing his work over some speakers. And I said, who cares whether it's a live figure, metal figure, two or three figures, or who or what? What I hear is interesting. Who cares how it's produced? It's, it's, this is radio. I'm only interested in what I hear. Who cares what the forest fire that you hear on radio was done by crumpling cellophane or a recording of a live forest fire? Does it sound like a forest fire? That's all that matters. I said, certainly put him on. But I almost lost him up on the afternoon of the show. I'd watched him work at the Chez Paris in Chicago in the oh, summer of 1936. That was the fall of that he went on the show. I was there with the, the president of the Musicians Union. I didn't pay much attention to his act, but I observed he was there. But I did observe he used Mortimer Sturd. And I was partial to that type of figure and the way Mortimer Sturd talked. I didn't pay much attention to Charlie McCarthy. So the afternoon of the broadcast, I said to, Char to Edgar, you're going to use the country dummy, aren't you? Now, Edgar's a very timid, extremely timid person. He would never, never raise it, never, never argue anything. And had I said, that's the figure I want, that would have been it. And I don't think the impact would have been as great as Charlie, because Charlie is the alter ego in all of us who dares to say the things yep. that none of us really dare to say. Bergen said, you think I should? Now, I always made it a point on that show, as you probably do, to never impinge my wishes upon the guest that was on the show. I said, Ed, Edgar, you use the figure you want to use. Not what I want to use. You use the figure you want mm. to use. And of course, Charlie was such a tremendous hit. Do you know what where he was after four shows? We used one, two, three, four shows in a row. He said, I don't think I can go on. I've used up all of my material. He said, I don't think I can go on. We said, we've got writers who'll find material for you. 20 or 30 years later, he was a multi-millionaire and was still in about his four, three or four hundred show. But he's ready to work. Oh, that's a wonderful story. And I never impose upon guests on this show. But will you tell a story about the two times you were knocked out? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Tell you I first saw Georgie. Again, I was a student at Yale. In the winter of 24, there was a lot of flood. There were a lot of floods down in Mississippi Basin and Mississippi River Basin. And all the cities throughout the United States were raising money to help the Red Cross for these persons who had lost their homes. 
So some promoter in New Haven, where Yale is, said, let's say, have a midnight show at the uh, Polite to raise money for this affair. And George was in town doing the jazz singer at the Schubert Theater. In the Yale Daily News, the little publication of the, the college, was this picture of this man. I pictured him as a Irving Thalberg, six foot one, very slim, very handsome, very elegant. I pictured anything but what I really, but anyway. So I, this evening of the affair, we Yale Collegians, about 15th piece orchestra, we decided to open the show at the Poli Theater. And we're setting up our instruments about 11.30, quarter to 12. And the students were outside. The students came in to buy a lot of tickets to see the show to help the cause. And they're throwing bags of water at each other, raising a hell outside the, in, in the part of the theater, in the front part of the theater. Suddenly in comes this little man with a big cigar. And he said, oh, where is it? Wait for me. And he goes down, he goes down to the curtain. It's George. And he peeks through a hole and he sees the students. He said, that's not for me. Turned around, went right back to the, his hotel and went to sleep. Oh, <laughs> that's right. And then I remember you came on and they threw a bag of water at you. <laughs> no. But he wasn't knocked out, but only once. Showing, well, showing they had very good taste. <laughs> Rudy Valley, we're again. coming right back. We'll be right back. The dog you love only gets one meal a day And if it's dull, he's out of luck So don't just water his dry food down Gravy, gravy, gravy it up when you stir up Gravy Train, you unlock a rich gravy coating for a nutritious meal he really loves. So don't just water it down. Gravy, gravy, gravy it up. Gravy, gravy, gravy it up. Gravy. Maxwell House is bringing folks together. Maxwell House, good to the last drop. Maxwell House is good morning. Maxwell House is a good day. Good to the last drop. Maxwell House. ABC brand. Coffee you can count on to bring people together. Always good to the last drop. Maxwell House is a good friend. Good to the last drop. Maxwell House. This is the Instapure water filter by Waterpick. And this is its filter cartridge, compared to a new one after the equivalent of 90 days of use in Los Angeles, or Miami, or New York. You see, the Instapure water filter by Waterpick reduces suspended particles like rust and sediment and some organic contaminants to help keep your drinking water cleaner and better tasting, even if it's clear water Florida. For cleaner, better tasting water, the Waterpick... Ideal compliment to my hot dog on Billy is a smattering of Reggie's. My double cheeseburger, that secret sauce, cries out for a dash of Reggie's. My peanut butter banana sandwiches stun the cafeteria when I include Reggie's. Experts agree, anything from a sandwich to a snack tastes better with a Reggie, the great tasting Ridge potato chip and four delicious flavors. My guests positively fight over my cream cheese cookie hors d'oeuvre, enhanced by Reggie's. You know, if you think just because you reach the age of 65, you have to spend the rest of your days reminiscing in a rocking chair, then watch out for my next guest. Here's the world's record holder for the running long jump and the standing jump and the 50-yard dash. Here's senior Olympic champ, Oren Graf. Welcome. <laughs> Come on over here, Orrin. Sure. How old are you? Seventy. Seventy and a half. And a half? <laughs> how did how did the senior Olympics come about? Let's come on out here so they can get us closer to okay. the lights here. How did the senior Olympics come about, Orrin? Well, they come about because they wanted to find out uh, what these older people could do. And uh, you see, Sanford, Florida is resort. Mm -hmm. And these older people come down there in the winter time, and uh, they they had something for them to do during the winter there. And you broke all the records. Well, no. So it, it got to growing, and they start coming from all parts of the country and entering it. And uh, they got so many different things that they can do. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you attribute the fact that you're in this kind of shape for seventy? You got 
You get legs that look like a young guy's. That's what they t t tell me. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've been running now since I joined the club. I work out all during the week. How much do you jog every day? Well, I don't jog. I, you run. I run. What is the difference? I mean, a jo jogging is just is slower. Slower, and, and running is running full out. Huh? Right. Well, yeah. As you More. step it up, I, I may run a mile, warming up. Warming up? Warming up. You mean you run more than a mile a day? Oh, yes. Wait, wait a minute. <laughs> and then I'll come back maybe with three quarters of a mile, and then I'll come back with another half, I keep stepping them up, and then another half, and then maybe a 440, oh, my and God. then maybe a 220, and then I go from there and I start throwing the discus and the shot and the javelin. Do you ever relax, take a day off and just cool it? Uh, Saturday. Saturday. <laughs> Do you still exercise, George? Huh? <laughs> oh, yes. You want to leave a call? <laughs> you, you still exercise? You oh, still yes. exercise? I get up every morning and go right back to bed again. <laughs> you know, a lot of people feel that it can be dangerous or become you know, too physically strenuous when you get a, to a certain age. Did you talk to your doctor before you got into this program, or, or have you always been in, in great health? Uh, well, I've been in athletics more or less right along. All your life. Right. So it's nothing new to you. Baseball, softball, bowling, and everything else. Ice you... skating and everything that's come along. And you really enjoy it? Uh, yes, but I don't enjoy long distance. How about, do you, so have, a, do you have a wife, Orin? She's here. Yeah, she's and, here. And does she run with you? No. Does, I... she, does she chase you? No, no, no. no. <laughs> she couldn't catch me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there she is, right around the corner. Oh, for heaven's sakes. Oh, wave your there, hand. There she That's is. That's Mrs. Graff, right there. <laughs> now, you have, uh, I'm told, I'm told that you have set several track uh, records. Yes, they've been broke, though, Mike. Your records Two. have been broken? Uh, yes. But you just have to keep setting them. You tell me when you set these records, and I give you credit for the standing jump and the running long jump and the 50-yard uh, dash. Now, tell me when you set those. All right. Let's see. In 77, I first set one in the long jump. That's a running long jump. Yeah. How long, how long did you jump? Uh, 14, three and a half inches. Wow. Good. And the Nine. record before that was only 13, five and a half. And for what age group was that? That's... That was 67. Good. Reef. And then at 68, well, that, that, let's see, that was the same year. Now, wait a minute. I went to another meet, and I went uh, 14, 6 and 3 quarters. I Good. broke my own record. You broke your own record. And then I went to another meet after that in Memphis. This one was in Atlanta. Where I, and then the next one was in Memphis, and I tied my own record again. Mm-hmm. Now, and, can you teach me some of these jumps? Now, what is this? There's the standing jump. And then there's the running long jump, right? Yeah, you couldn't do the, the running long jump here. Why, we don't have enough room? You don't have it. I need about 90 feet runway, and plus you need sand. I'll tell you why, Mike. Oh. Because the sand will give as you hit with your yeah, feet. Yeah, this will not give This enough. will not. This will catch your foot, and you're going to pull a muscle. Well, how about the, just the standing? The standing, nothing to it. Can, can you do it on the mat? Yeah. Can you give us an idea? What's your record at st the standing jump? Uh, well, I don't know if it's a record or not, because I don't know if there's even a record kept on that standing jump. Well, I, ha I have done seven foot two. Good grief. That's terrific. Mm -hmm. Well, how long is this mat, guys? So oh, I won't do it. Oh, well, well, they, they got it marked right here. So here's seven uh, feet. I won't do no seven feet now, I guarantee that. Well, just I haven't anywhere in here, and we'll cheer you. You're going to cheer you. If, if you go up here, you've got a standing ovation. I guess so. I'll stand on my head, too. <laughs> See what you can do, Orrin. Just don't, don't pressure yourself or anything. I don't want you to hurt yourself. Look at the physique on this guy. Mm -hmm. That's almost in seven feet. It's right in there. About six, ten. Now, you brought something for each of our seniors. May we have them, please? Right. I'd, I'd like to eat, give each one a medal, because they are all stars, and they're all first place winners. Thank so they, they should have it.
Tuesday, like Mom, like me. When the man of the house ran off, Linda Levin and Christy McNichol were left to make it on their own. Mom, I'm really mad at you. You're just flying around, giving up. And both mother and daughter thought that other men could fill the lonely void. I want to know where he's sleeping tonight. I don't want you to lose respect for me. You think you're the only woman whose husband ever left her? And then the unexpected happened. He came home. Do you think we can be a family again? Tuesday at 9, 8 Central. If you're nuts about movies, you'll be nuts about WHT, the movie network. Every month, mystery, action, comedy, the greatest movies on TV, uncut and uninterrupted, plus entertainment specials and exciting sporting events. A solid month of family entertainment on WHT subscription TV. All for only $19. Call WHT now, 212-520-2700. It's always great to wake and greet the morning. There are so many different ways to start the day. Park sausages give every sausage lover 18 delicious ways to start the day. From our naturally spiced little links to our beef brown and serve to our hot and sagey patties. More park sausages, Mom. Please. Wake up to Park's famous flavor sausage and find 18 famous ways to start your day. Want to enjoy the best show on Broadway? Bring your mama to Mama Leone's for Mother's Day and let us entertain your appetite. While you take in the atmosphere, Mama's Antipasto Overture begins. Then comes Leone's Pasta Parade and specialties of the house. At Mama Leone's, you can't stop singing. You can't stop eating. You can't stop laughing. Mama Leone's, 48th Street, west of Broadway. It's just a takeoff on the two-step anyway, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it? well, it's... What they know, call a Lindy today. We used call to call it a one, Lindy. Two, three, four, you yeah, know. Yeah, sure. And, of course, I was in Cuba, and watching the Cubans do, you know, rumba dancing, it's just sensational. You know, they don't move here, don't move there. Just it's the, just their backside. The hip, just the hip, 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 the And I learned how to dance up in Harlem, watching them dance. You, you got, you got one of those rumbas left in you like the Cubans? No. No, 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 no. no, no. I got Tell, emphysema. I know. <laughs> Tell the story about the little chorus girl who came to you and was out of money. And you were known for a guy who helped struggling actors. You had a lot of compassion and oh, still yeah. have. Well, I, I don't know. If somebody comes to you and needs help, you give it to them. And she came to you and had no money, no little money. chorus girl? Yeah, and I helped her. What they were so what, sorry. What'd you give her, George? 300. You remember who she was? No. We know who it was. George. Yeah? You don't want to tell it. You're too, got too no. much class, huh? No. Would it bother you if I told? You don't want to yeah, tell her. Don't okay, tell. I won't tell. Very important lady he helped. Huh? Did you date her too, George? No. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you... She in, became very famous, didn't she? Oh, and how? <laughs> and how? The biggest yeah. name I know on television. <laughs> <laughs> You're quite a guy. Yeah. You really are. Who's your favorite uh, guy that you work with in pictures of all the people? You've you worked with so many oh, super jobs. I think Cagney, Muni, Tracy. Oh. I worked with so many Academy Award winners. They all won the award, but me. Did you ever, were you ever nominated, George? Yeah, I was nominated. I ran fourth. 
Can you find out in the top five where you where you placed? Well, I was. I know I was four. Out of the money. Out of the, out of the money. money. Well, I my, was your son-in-law. I mean, he bets on all the winners. <laughs> with that? you. Oh yes, my yes. son-in-law came out. I got. I go to the track about once a year. I saw George out yeah. there. My son-in-law is uh, in the computers and everything, and he's he's a very deep, very bright kid. And he's on the dean's list at, at Wharton. And he took a racing form. I know from nothing in a race. Oh. I just look at the horses, and if the horse looks like it's got a few breaths left, I say, well, I like the way he looks, and I like those colors and the name. I'll, if it's a name I called one of my kids or something, I'll bet on that horse. My son-in-law said, Dad, that's not the way it works. He said, he picked four straight that's winners right. the day I was with George, and I didn't catch on until about the third one. Oh, I, I bet on the third one. Did you I bet? You, yeah. <laughs> Did you really? <laughs> Well, certainly. Am I in on some of the action, Joe? No, yeah, any time. <laughs> George, in my book, as a movie star, you're a 10. A 10? A 10, yeah. <laughs> More with the Super Seniors. Right on the way. All right, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Through the courtesy and confirmation of the Dime Savings Bank of New York, I'm going to offer the most sensational giveaway. All you got to do is introduce a friend to the Dime who will buy a 26-week certificate for ten to $35,000 or more, and you pick up one of these wonderful gifts. You say you're not satisfied? You say you want more? Okay, we're going to give your friend a gift, too, plus the highest interest rates. So, friends, rush right down to the Dime, and the next time you see me, you're going to thank me. Starting this week, Casey Kasem comes to television. Join him on America's Top Ten for a review of The Record Charts with special performances of key hits among this week's Top Ten. Catch Casey's exclusive interview with Blondie's Deborah Harry. And where are the monkeys now? What are they doing these days? This week with Casey Kasem on America's Top Ten. America's Top Ten premiere Wednesday at 7.30. Presenting Witchcraft, a tantalizing way to make a hot sandwich with the Sandwich Crafter by Equity. Make a Reuben Witch, a Pizza Witch, a Tomato Cheese and Ham Witch, and any which way sandwich. In just two minutes, the Sandwich Crafter crimps, seals, and toasts your sandwich to a golden brown. The Sandwich Crafter by Equity, where the ordinary sandwich becomes Witchcraft. Listen to why travelers in the Northeast are going Greyhound. With the price of gas and everything else, uh, Greyhound is, is the best way to go. As far as the schedules, um, I think you can go pretty much anywhere that you want to with Greyhound. Greyhound drivers do the driving for you. They do it well. And I'm free to sit back and relax and sleep or read or whatever I care to do. It's a lot cheaper to go Greyhound. Go Greyhound from any of the 23 suburban stations in the metro area, including seven on Long Island. Here's something that's always, I wanted to ask George about, and this, I thought that the first time I asked you that you were kidding me about it, of all the 105 movies this man has made, he has never seen himself on the screen. He still, does that still go? Yes. What happens if you're passing a TV set and someone has one of your movies on you? Just turn your oh, back. Oh, I just keep going. <laughs> I want to tell you something, George. You're terrific in movies. No. You ought to look at them sometime. <laughs> From, from the first day, you've never seen any never rushes? Uh... No, I made a test many years ago when I was a dancer, and I, guy rushed me up. At that time, they put red in your eyes and made up your hands. And, of course, Harry Richmond, God rest his soul and peace, made a test at the same time. And he looked like a black man on the screen. I said, oh, my God, what am I going to look like, you know? So I said, that's me, and they said, yes. And I, I would never look at myself after that. And when you became a big star, you still no, weren't even curious? No, no. To look at... Because, as I said, everybody was better than me, so I just went along with him. <laughs> oh, you were. And you got to see him. I want to tell you something. Yeah, Sometimes right. you got to check in because you were something else on that screen. I know they rerun one of them on Sunset Boulevard or something, Scarface. Yeah. And uh, people said, will you come down and see it? I said, no, I won't go, <laughs> won't go near the street. <laughs> I, uh, be too frightened. I it mean, the way I look now, I was a young guy at that time. <laughs> that was 1928. I, I got news. You look, you look pretty darn uh, good right now, my friend. Doesn't getting he? shorter. Well, 
I know, I know what is said about a lot of people, but my first guest is uh, truly a legend in his own time. Uh, just the mere mention of his name brings smiles to faces of millions of Americans. Here's the Toastmaster General himself. Here's George Jessel. Tell them about the truck you got knocked out twice in one night. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I've got to tell you a story that has to do with him. Having played these tough guys in ever so many movies, and uh, I have no reason to say this because we both haven't got much money, so I'm not going <laughs> to borrow any. You know, I don't have to incur his good favor any longer because I've had it for years. But here's a story about a gangster in Chicago. Tough guy. Yet, on every Friday night, on the eve of the Shabbat, the Sabbath, he'd go out to Halsted Street and have this noodle soup and chicken with his mother. And this particular time, he came in an armored car, and as he got out in front of his mother's house, they shot at him, real good. And he just had enough strength to climb up and knock on his mother's door and lay on the floor. He opened the door and said, hello, Morris. Mama. They got me. She says, you'll eat later, then you'll tell me all about it. <laughs> That's right. George, I wanted to ask you, uh, the other evening I, I... You don't have to ask me. You tell me. I'm working for you. <laughs> but I, was, I, was in a, I was in a restaurant uh, down at the beach, and I ran into the famous Neil Diamond, who who was playing in a picture called The Jazz Singer. That's right. And you were the original jazz singer. Uh, well, I, I, I named the play and I wrote most of the dialogue. It's only 55 years ago. But I must say, uh, the Jolson version, all that has been discussed and repeated and badly, it's not as important as the Civil War. No, but weren't you before Jolson as the oh, jazz singer? Oh, Paul of Roberts. I was on the stage for three years. But the Warner Brothers at that time not only had no money to produce a movie, they had nothing to eat. And uh, they tried to dig up money from all over. They <laughs> finally got Jolson, and Al Jolson, you could make him believe anything you want. You could say, Al, uh, uh, have you played the cello lately? He said, no, not since last year. Never played the cello in his whole life. <laughs> so they told him it was the story of his life, <laughs> that the jazz singer was a boy who ran away and gave up a career uh, uh, as an artist and as an entertainer to take his father's place and sing to his god in the synagogue. And Joseph believed it didn't happen at all. <laughs> his father was a guy who made things kosher, killing chickens. And, um... <laughs> Are you serious? I'm very serious. They made that whole thing up? Yes, and, and, and he sent that big press story. This is the story of my life. But more important, he put up the money to make the picture. <laughs> he had the money to, to sure. Warner Brothers. They, <laughs> Warner Brothers would have made it with Mickey Rooney. They didn't get <laughs> Oh, and, 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 and Mickey, rightly so. He's Mickey a great is guy. the toast of Broadway uh, and, and also up for an Oscar. Well, and, I'm and, glad. And, and, and He's a highly a talented fella. Brilliantly and talented. And a very nice fella, too, Mickey Rooney. I want to do something with right you. right name is Rosenberg, you know. <laughs> yeah. I thought it was Yule. Yule. <laughs> Joe Yule. Is they made that up. That was his father's name. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is wonderful. Any other stories oh, that are fallacies? Oh, fallacies? yeah, I got all kinds of stories. Tell them about the time he got knocked out twice in one night. No, you like that because it had to do with knocking out. <laughs> when I'm, did you get knocked out twice in one night? I'll tell you when we get through it. No. <laughs> no, wait, I want to hear his story. No, this takes too long. <laughs> <laughs> This story is a true one. Two young cops are walking the beat, and they're anxious for promotion. And they get a meeting with the chief of police. One goes in, comes out a couple of slaves, it looks like I got a good chance to be promoted. The other guy goes in. She said to him, who killed Lincoln? And this young cop says, I don't know. He says, well, when you find out, come back. But the cop goes out, the friend says, how did you do? Great, I just got a murder case. <laughs> The best 
short gag of the year. And, uh, this year? Uh, almost any year. The short story that <laughs> I've ever told is a guy with a, what do you call that, with a heart? A Open pacemaker. Heart surgery. Pacemaker. Yeah. And thank the Lord we don't, uh, none of us need it until the show is over. Anyway. <laughs> Stanley Cowan, he got a pacemaker. I says, how does it work? He says, fine. <laughs> Every time I sneeze, my garage door opens. <laughs> Go ahead, yes, please. You're on a roll. Don't stop. And, uh, oh, I can do the whole two hours. You can go home with it. Yeah, but I, I couldn't do it every day like you do. <laughs> anyway, there's a Brooklyn an apartment house, you know, people live in the front, live in the back. Yeah. And these two women meet on the stairs. Woman says, Mrs. Cohn, did you see where they bombed our embassy in Pakistani? The other woman says, I live in the back, I never see anything. <laughs> Channel 2 News, News Watch with correspondent Roland Smith. Good afternoon. New York State's former controller for 24 years, Arthur Levitt, is dead at 79. Another black church set a fire in Far Rockaway, the fourth in two weeks. Police hunt the arsonist. President Carter declares parts of Florida a disaster area as the flood of Cuban refugees goes on, and the bodies of eight Americans killed in the Iranian rescue mission are coming home. Sure, Sir Isaac Newton unraveled the mysteries of gravity. But could he have unraveled the mysteries of Rubik's Cube? Three weeks ago, Judge Smith retired to her chambers with Exhibit A, Rubik's Cube. She hasn't been seen since. Warning, once you get your hands on Rubik's Cube, you may never be able to put it down. Rubik's Cube, over three billion combinations, but just one solution from Ideal. Newswatch with Rollin Smith. Function yes. In, in an office here. Yeah, I sit there and people walk by and they say, is that you? And I say, yes. <laughs> Everyone loves commercials. And you, you've done a couple of commercials that a lot of... There's a line from a deodorant commercial. Lay that line on us in the deodorant commercial. You know the one oh, I'm talking the, about? Oh, the one about in the prison? Yeah. Where I say this place could use a, a stick-up. <laughs> One line. One line. Then I do. I got one on that's on now. You're in the back of a limo, I think. Yeah, and I don't even know the girl is sitting alongside me. I you just got in there and delivered another line. That's all. And I said, uh, tune it up. <laughs> that's a big hit. <laughs> that's wonderful. Did you ever think 20 or 30 years ago that you'd be doing commercials and doing just one line? No, Did that I, ever occur to you? No, I never could. I thought I think they're great. The one line is oh, because wow. you're in and out. Yeah. I don't know what the commercial is about. I've never seen it. <laughs> or care. Were you a quick study when yes. you were doing pictures? Yes. Some people are blessed yes. with being able to look at a script and just boom. Yeah, I was a pretty quick study, but I didn't have too many lines. Yeah. Because you... I always played the guy that, you know, with a gun or something like that. Yeah. After all, I, I was I 105 pictures and I was killed 85 times. <laughs> I'm walking you, you go, eh? You were the original rat face. <laughs> but you, you, did you get the girl in many pictures? I know away from the pictures you got a lot of girls, George. Well, I yeah, that. I did pretty well that way, but uh, no, not in the pictures. I never, I always got killed. I heard, I heard through the grapevine that everything Errol Flynn claimed you were really doing. <laughs> <laughs> Is that true, George? I wouldn't know. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Too much of a gentleman to yeah, talk about. Yeah, well, I... Uh, That's, I never would discuss women, you know. That was the thing that was out of well, my that's ballpark. That's wonderful. I always put all the women on a pedestal. But you went with some very beautiful women. Yes. Big, big stars. Yes. Can we name just a few of the ladies you dated? You name them. <laughs> Carol Lombard? Yes. Betty Grable? Yes. Look at this. I'm uh, batting a thousand. Only met you two people. Uh, Marlene Dietrich? Marlene Dietrich? Yeah. Didn't you have to do something to her in a movie one time? George, you've always been a perfect gentleman, and he meant what he said about ladies. He respects them. 
Uh, but they wanted you to clout her in a picture, didn't they? Yeah, they wanted me to hit her, and I said, well, I don't like to hit women. I never would do it in reality or real life. And, of course, they said, well, you must, you must. And she came to me and says, George, you've got to hit me. I says, no. I so finally went on for a couple of days, and I finally did hit her. And in the, she had a line where she was said with the, she was hit harder. But it, she twisted the line. She says, I've never been hit harder than that in my life. <laughs> Didn't you knock her down and she, yes, broke, up, she broke, broke, her ankle, broke her ankle? That one of those famous legs. Yeah. Holy Toledo. <laughs> well, with the, uh, you know, I was a phony price fighter for a while. No, you, I, uh, now listen, yeah. Jimmy Cagney, when I interviewed Jimmy Cagney, I said something to the effect that you were a very tough kid. And he said, listen, let me tell you who is really tough. And he didn't say was, he said is. Uh, he said, one time I was fool around with George Raft, and, and he said, I took my hand back, and George just said, Jim, you'd be sitting on the floor by the time you got that thing caught. That's right. <laughs> because fighters hit you right, boom, straight on. They don't draw them back, you know. Well, I, what could, what could a guy do when, who had no education? So I tried to be a price fighter. I tried to be a ball player. I was a dancer. And how I got in pictures, I don't know. How did you get in pictures? They picked me up. <laughs> <laughs> who, who picked you up? A fellow named Roland Brown. Where were you? In Roseland Ballroom or one of no, those places? No, no. I was, uh, I had just came back from England, and I came to California because I had played here in Vaudeville. I see. So I come out here, and I was sitting in the Brown Derby, which is right here on Vine Street. Sure. Famous And this fellow came over to me and said, well, I'd like you to go into a motion picture for me. Just like that, not knowing what you yeah, could do? And I says, uh, well, I've never been a motion picture actor. I said, as a dancer. He says, yes, I know. He said, will you come down to the studio tomorrow? I said, I'd be very happy to. So I went what down. What studio was that, George? The William Fox studio on Western Avenue. Uh -huh. And there was a man by the name of Gardner who was the casting director. And this fellow, Roland Brown, was the, the director and the writer of the, the picture. Spencer Tracy was the star oh, of the picture. So, Your first uh, picture. Spencer. So the wind-up, he says, well, I know George Raft. He was a dancer. He was famous in New York, working in all the places that he worked in. Who said that, Tracy? No, Gardner. Oh, Gardner. So, uh, but we got people on the lot that we have on the contract that we much rather put in the picture. So they kept arguing back and forth, and I says, look, wait a minute. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll go in. I'll do what you want me to do. And if my work is satisfactory, you make some arrangements to pay me. If it isn't satisfactory, you don't owe me anything. And I was the first one on the screen to say, I had touched my handkerchief and my hat and said, this town isn't big enough for both of us. One of us has to leave. You winged that line? You yeah. had lived that line? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, they called me. Who were you saying it to at the time? Uh, uh, Tracy, was it? No. Uh, Leon Ames, who later did... Uh, did the drunk act. He was the perennial drunk, wasn't yeah. he? No, he was the guy that did... Uh, some tell oh, Leon Ames yeah. was a Ford dealer here for a while, That's wasn't right. he? That's and uh, Bazooka Bob Burns. Oh, for God. And they play, all played gangsters. See, and I played Tracy's bodyguard in the Le picture. You know who I was thinking of who played the perennial drunk? Leon Errol. Leon Errol. Remember how yeah. wonderful he was yeah. with those rubbery legs? But you actually said this town is... Uh, isn't big enough isn't, for both of us. And what did you do with your handkerchief? I touched my handkerchief and touched my hat and left. And that did it, a whole yeah. career from there. And from when, there do you remember what they paid you, George, for that first stint? $150 a week. That was a ton of money in those days, wasn't it? <laughs> no, I no? don't know. You had made more in vaudeville? Oh, yeah. I made more as a dancer. I worked in four different places in the day. Were you ever? Were you a self-taught dancer? Or yes. did people... I watched. I watched them up in Holland. I was, oh, I was never a good dancer. Oh, no, wait a minute. No, I was a stylist. Well, that's better. Yeah, of course, I mean, I, and I first introduced the French tango in America. Where, did, where did you learn it? Just, uh, I was in France when I was there, and I watched people dance, and I sort of introduced it, and I introduced a dance in a picture called Bolero. Is that the picture where they wanted to, sh you were with Carol Lombard, and they wanted to kill you? While you were dancing with her? And no, that was the other one, rumba. I did the rumba before it was popular. <laughs> Ten years before, I didn't know what I was doing. How did, how did that happen? I don't know. I, I just thought of the different things. That was all.
the Super Seniors with Mike's co-host, George Rapp, George Jessel, actress Molly Kajan, Rudy Valley. And now, here's the star of our show, Mike Douglas. Thank you very much. We're calling this show The Super Seniors. And there's one of them in the back right now. And Super describes my guests today from A to Z. And not just Super for what they are, but for what they have done. You take a look at my co host George Raft as a scrappy teenager. Look here. Huh? And here's Molly Pecan just a few years ago. And look at Rudy Valley when he still lived in Maine. Huh? And how about this shot of George Jessel? <laughs> These four people are special for another reason. They haven't grown old. And this song explains it all. Fairy tales can come true, as it can happen to you if you're young at heart. For it's hard you will find to be narrow mind if you're young at heart. Now you can go to extremes with impossible schemes. You can laugh when your dreams fall apart at the seams. And life gets more exciting with each passing day. And love is either in your heart or on its way. Don't you know? That it's worth every treasure on earth to be young at heart. For as rich as you are, it's much better by far to be young at heart. And if you should survive to a hundred and five, think of all you derive. Out of being alive, and here is the best part. You had a head start if you are among the very young at heart. And if you should survive to a hundred and five, now think of all you derive out of being alive. And here is the best part. You had a head start If you are among the very young at heart. Thank you. Talk about young at heart. Take a look at my co-host, the legendary George Rapp. Being a newsbreaker means breaking news fast. Jim, just seconds ago the meeting broke up, it appears. So you're always on top of things. John Law has ordered his men back to work. It began with a phone call once. It means breaking news no one else can break. I'm here to surrender myself. This is the test. It detects. And it means breaking news that has an effect on your life. The valve. You guys saved my wife's life. Believe me, this is something important. At Channel 2, they don't call them newsbreakers for nothing. I used to love toasted cheese, but now I love a hot Italian. Introducing Stouffer's three new hot Italian sandwiches. When I was a kid, I was really into hamburgers. Now I've got a hot Italian. Hearty sandwiches to have at home anytime. Simply heat and eat. I wanted something easy. It was peanut butter and jelly. 
Now, I've got the hot Italians. Stouffer's new hot Italian sandwiches in mild sausage, meatball, or hot sausage. Scientists estimate millions of germ-carrying roaches in our city in outlying areas. They kill these roaches where they hide and breed. Black Flag's special city formula for tough city roach problems. Regular sprays scatter their power. Black Flag concentrates its killing power, penetrates cracks between cabinets and walls, between baseboards, and it's concentrated for long-lasting killing action up to four weeks. Kills roaches where they hide and breed. Black Flag's special city formula for tough city roach problems. Tony Randall for mm, Tetley Tea. I like those tiny little tea leaves in Tetley Tea. Know why Tetley Tea tastes so good? Because tiny is tastier. As a gourmet, I know that tiny peas and tiny baby lamb chops are the tastiest. The same with tea leaves. The most flavorful are the tiny young leaves packed into Tetley Tea bags. So for rich, refreshing tea, hot or iced, I drink Tetley because tiny is tastier. Well, George, you just told me your age. You want to tell this group? Very happy to. I was born 1895. Whoa! You are. When is your birthday? September the 26th. So you'd be 85 this That's year? That's right. Holy Toledo. <laughs> you Toledo look, you, look, right. you look wonderful. Thank you. What are you doing? What are you, what are you doing these days, George? <laughs> I don't do anything. I'm an ambassador of goodwill to the Riviera Hotel in Las Vegas. But you do go to an office every day. All the news at 6. Mazzola, for goodness. Our runners traveled over 100 miles and carried pouches filled with the goodness of maize, corn. Today, this goodness, corn oil goodness, is essential to Mazzola margarine. So Mazzola has no cholesterol, naturally. And a fresh, delicious flavor, naturally. Taste Mazzola margarine. It gets goodness from me. Mazzola corn goodness. Announcing a price freeze at Genevieve Drug Stores. Prices frozen on everything you buy in every Genevieve store. We're holding prices down by freezing regular prices on over 25,000 items. Prescriptions, cosmetics, health and beauty aids, photo supplies, picnic items, auto supplies. Genovese is the first drug chain to freeze prices on everything. This is a price freeze, a real price freeze by Genovese, a real drugstore. George, uh, since you know stories, and many, many of them, probably more than Milton Berle has stolen. <laughs> well, and I have some cards, and all I have, there's just one word on each of these cards, and I'll shuffle them up. And as I say the word, you tell a story about whatever the subject happens to be. You game? Well, okay, I'll take a chance, sure. Right. Wives. A lucky guess. Well, wives. There's all kinds of stories about wives. I know I waited many, many years for a wife of mine. And she always reminded me of the story about Will Rogers, you know? Where he said he never met a man he didn't like. I had a wife like that. She never met a man. <laughs> Mother-in-law. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, no, he can't help you. No. You gotta go on your own. I never had any jokes about mother-in-law because... Oh, good. Let's go on to something else. Yes. All right. <laughs> Doctors. Oh, I know oh, we got a good right. subject. Okay. Go to the next one. <laughs> see if you can find it. Restaurants. Well, there's a lot of jokes about <laughs> restaurants. I remember... <laughs> it's funny, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but this is uh, dirty. I wouldn't, wouldn't even tell this... <laughs> oh, well, Let's go on to another one. Money! Oh. Got to be something there. Money, I lost a great deal of money in the stock market. And the, my last trip was, as a friend of mine, God love him, Chico Marx, you remember Chico? Yes, yes. And uh, he had no idea of the value of money. He'd give guys $50 to play against them in a card game. Just to have, 
again. To have some fun. And he borrowed some money from his brother Harper, who was an angel, and from me, to go to Canada to play an engagement in a nightclub. And he called me up and called all of his pals up and said, look, I found a way that we can get rich. And to buy this stock, I'll guarantee you against loss. Now, he just borrowed the money to go to Toronto. <laughs> He's going to guarantee us for the loss. Anyhow, what they did with him, they showed him some pennies on a wall and said, this is a copper mine. Well, <laughs> and how this happened? Well, he says, I was in a pool room and uh, playing pool, and a ball jumped off the table, which happens every once in a while. And when the guy went to look for it under the pool table, they found uranium. Now, how this grows under a pool table in t Toronto, I have no idea, but I'm not a geologist, is what happened. Well, he said the guy who racks up the balls, found it, and he made him the president of the company. And uh, you can get in 10 cents a share. And I bought a few thousand shares at 10 cents. And a few days later, he said, it's 24 cents now. I said, sell it. He said, to who? <laughs> Uh, if you have any more, I'll wait till I go on the next show. We'll be <laughs> How about uh, doing your classic Hello Mother bit? No. Oh, if Remember it's that? all up to your audience, I'd be glad. <laughs> you know, I, I, like, I like the phone. Well, it's, it's the old, <laughs> Super 70 it's the old fashioned phone. <laughs> and he'll bring me out with this in an age, uh, a permissive age. I saw one of those pawny movies the other night, and I was embarrassed. And the third time I saw it, I even more. <laughs> <laughs> it's a remarkable thing, though, that which has good humor and warm humor lives despite what they buy in Vegas or whatever joints are still open. And I introduced this years ago, where I came on the stage, picked up a phone like this, and supposedly talked to my mother. And since then, nearly everybody has copied it. Uh, what's his name? B Berman, the name Berman, everybody. But I have no enmity. I like to believe what Mrs. Eddy said, that no one's errors offend you but your own. So I'm not angry at these fellows who have stolen my stuff. They should just fall off the top of the Washington Monument. <laughs> <laughs> Operator, I'd like to get a long distance call, New York, Umglick, 8625. Yes. Thank you very much. Hello. How are Mr. Schwartz? How are you, Mr. Schwartz? Georgie Jessel. How are you? You just fell down the stairs and broke your ankle? Oh, for heaven's sake. A woman your age. Break an ankle. Would you mind running up two flights and asking my mother? Oh, my mother is right there helping you. Well, I'm glad that she has that navelly spirit. Put her on the phone. Hello, Mama. Your son, Georgie. Your son from the money every week. <laughs> How are you? How are you? You see spots in front of your eyes? Or wear your glasses like Dr. Bloomberg told you? They're on your forehead. Well, how long will it take you to get it down? This is like the Brooklyn Bridge. You got the glasses on? How is it? You see the spots better with the glasses. <laughs> that bird I sent you home for the parlor for your birthday. You cooked it? <laughs> Mama, there's a South American parrot. He spoke five languages. He should have said something. 